My, my goal for the next 45 minutes is to uh, hopefully not embarrass um, and make Niall regret putting me on the stage. But as he mentioned, I wrote a forward for the Esther workbook that I'm kind of proud of. If you've ever um, read that before, come talk to me. If you haven't, you go read it. Uh, I'm starting a new thing, but everything I'm talking about is related to this, but not necessarily talking through it totally today. So I have very nonlinear, really meta talks, and I have... If you do the math on the number of slides I have, they can only be up here maybe 20 seconds on average. And I also like, I like read lots of papers, and there's some papers that suggest that you remember things better if you take pictures of the slides. So I'm not saying that you have to take pictures of slides, but if you want to, they might not be there very, very long. So this is a talk that, and, and I'm gonna come back to the title. Does, any, does anyone know a book English as she has spoke. Has anyone ever heard of that? Yeah, so wait for that. That's coming up. But there's, there's power in language, and in particular, the, the narratives that, that we tell, right? And I think this is uh, somewhat related to the conversation that we just watched. And in the last two months, I read a bunch of the social technical papers going back to the Tavistock Institute and all, all these kind of interesting dynamics about how language shapes what we do. Um, if, if you've never heard of this guy, Ed, Edgar Sheen, he did a bunch of interesting work on organizational dynamics. Um, but I think this kind of frames a lot of what I'm hoping that you, that you learn today, is that if you get new, new words, new connections, that enables you to think different thoughts, take different actions. Uh, I'll just let you read this, because I, I think this is also related to it, especially the second one. If, uh, just, just for my own metrics, how many people came here from Africa and, and from the Middle East? Nice. So we're defined by the stories we tell, by the stories we can tell, by the stories we want to tell, and by the stories we don't tell. Because some stories we don't tell, right? So this first part, I'm going to tell a little bit about me and talk about myself. So in my, I'm like the main character in my story. So my, my background, really, like I said, I, I got a degree in math, and then my wife started medical school, and she told me I should probably figure out how to feed us. So I got a job at a startup as a programmer, and I ended up working on a bunch of different kind of open source projects and getting involved in a bunch of communities and working for a bunch of different companies. Um, at the end of the day, I feel like I had a fairly privileged perspective to watch a lot of the internet being built, uh, particularly the involvement with the, the Velocity Conference. Does, did anyone ever get to a Velocity Conference? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that as well. Um, I wrote this book for O'Reilly, or part of this book for O'Reilly, about web operations that came out in 2009. I'm going to mention that. But that early phase and like that exposure gave me a lot of formative ideas that have sort of become what, what DevOps conversations are. But then the last, I'm going to say, not quite 10 years, I spent a lot of time focused on uh, very, very big organizations in highly regulated environments. And so that kind of informed some of the other stuff. Um, that I'm going to share too. So like I said, I'm, I'm starting this new adventure. And then just for the sake of completeness, I'm going to show myself in various configurations of hair and beard. So the next time you see me, you won't be afraid. It's the same guy. Same monster. So I will look different next time you see me. Pretty, pretty sure. So that's the introduction. So there I was. Once upon a time. Software developer. Working for a, a startup, it's a good time. And, and the first startup I worked at, I hated Agile. I, I came out of this academic environment where we made lots of software, and all of a sudden there's like, we gotta have these planning meetings and points, and like, I thought it was the stupidest thing ever. Strongly disliked. Um, it didn't make sense to me. And part of it was like, I just, 
there's this arc I'm going to bring back to the SRE, but you basically have this, this transition from something that is good and people are getting some benefit and then it transition into this mode. And I didn't understand this the first few times I saw this with Agile and then I've watched it over and over again with DevOps and then you're going to see it definitely happen with SRE, but it's that people take like some superficial understanding and then they take this like very empty like ritualized version of it and they just try to make it the thing without really understanding what they're doing or, or why it ever worked in the first place. So I, I hated the fact that there's like this scrum master that was supposedly the expert on anything um, and I just didn't think it was working and, and when I would say, hey, how about we try to do this thing that might help us, they'd say, that's not what Agile does. And like, like, nah, can't, can't do that. Um, but then I got very lucky actually and I stumbled into the, this was a group of people that happened to be where I lived in Utah in Salt Lake and I met this guy, Alistair Coburn, who's the reason the Agile Manifesto was signed in Salt Lake and I got into a bunch of XP practices and I really fell in love with like the Agile aspects of that kind of technical practice and being able to do continuous integration and verify this stuff and, and you know, that just made sense to me at, at the time. Um, and now, now I, th this is just a quick aside, but I would value runtime observability over um, test-driven development um, for a variety of reasons, which I'll get to in a moment. So fast forward. I, I invented DevOps right then. I know. This is embarrassing. I didn't invent DevOps. I stole it. <laughs> this is a good advice for SRE too. Good SRE copy, great SRE steal. And I stole it from my friends, right? So this is, uh, if, you've, if you've ever heard of DevOps, this is really where the word comes from. This, not like people get mad at you when you say root cause these days, but this talk, I'm in the audience watching my two friends, John Alspa and Paul Hammond, give their presentation on doing 10 deploys a day at Flickr, which at the time, people like lost their minds and they told them it was irresponsible and all these other things. Now it's passe, um, but that was a different time and place. So I'm in the audience and I'm tweeting because we do these things or we did these things. I used to live tweet stuff. Don't just say no, you aren't respecting other people's problems. And I put this tag DevOps on this tweet. And then I put a bunch of them, watching them. And those are still there. And I was already working on this, this meeting that we were sort of calling like agile infrastructure with, with Patrick. And we were planning to do this before that because we'd met. But I'm, I'm going to rewind a little bit more because that doesn't happen until 2009, but there's a couple other things that happen that are worth noting. So this is 2006. This is a very famous interview. I'm going to make a call back to this in a bit later, but Werner Vogel's interview, usually taken out of context and simplified and, and kind of reduced to you build it, you run it, without any context for feedback loops or why. But that's 2006, so just Mark that in your mind, the timeline. This is 2007. So this is a blog post that was written by Jesse Robbins, who at the time was running uh, infrastructure operations at Amazon. And the blog post is basically arguing, so this is kind of like the golden age of Puppet. Um, Chef's not born yet. Um, this kind of like old paradigm. But he's basically arguing that with traditional operations that there is, we'll, we'll, we'll call all the colors on this toil. And then you get to this other side, this new way, and there's less toil, right? 2008, this is a talk I gave over and over about the wall of confusion. Sometimes people reference that. That was mine. Also, there's arguments about who said it first, but I said it a lot, infrastructure's code, like, all the time. And then there's this book that comes out, and I wrote a chapter that I think 
stands up pretty well, called the Agile Infrastructure 2009. So just for the sake of the calendar, we're going to have 2006 before cloud, and then 2009 after DevOps, and like something happens, the three years in the middle. So we met at an Agile conference, and this, to me, it's really about extending Agile to running software, right? Because when, when Agile Manifesto was signed, most software was shipped on physical media, and you didn't really have the servers as a critical part of the value chain. And so it was like Agile, 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 and then the deployment was this big waterfall dump onto this thing, and like no, no one really could do it. And I wanted to extend continuous integration to my systems, to my servers, because I had been burned so many times about the differences between dev, test, and prod. But we didn't sit down and we're like, now we're going to DevOps. Right? It, this, it evolved from the need, the necessity, the pressure, the evolutionary pressure to deliver software as a service. Right? So this is the internet, software as a service um, at scale. You get in trouble when you say this word around people who worked at you know, the real big places. If it's not a million cores, nothing. Um, but these systems never stop or we hope they don't stop. And they never stop changing. So my motive, why I got into Agile or any of these things in the very beginning was I wanted to compete. I wanted to make value for my company, for whatever I was part of, but I was really motivated to compete. I'm very competitive. And I used to write silly blog posts like this. But it was all about trying to make it work and trying to make it work better and then better, and then better, because I wanted to win some game. Call it business, whatever. So all the buzzwords, all the time. I, I actually think these are one phenomena, right? If you, can't, if you can't deploy with like almost no cost, then you have no business trying to run a bunch of microservices. You're just gonna, you're just gonna make your life very, very hard. So this is my Definition of DevOps. Optimizing the human experience and performance of operating software with software and with humans. Now, sometimes people get confused. We're going we're to come back to language in a minute. Um, to me, it was not about devs doing ops, ever. It was about making uh, the ops kind of go away. Dev, deving the ops, like, make the software do the work and do that in a feedback loop. And this is, I'm just including this for completeness, but this is what I call the CALMS test. And this is, if you go back to early DevOps days, Mountain View, blog posts, if someone talks about DevOps and they don't, it, like if, if they don't explicitly call this out, that's fine. But if they don't even know this, then it's like kind of a test that they didn't really pay attention. They didn't do the reading, right? They're just trying to like market you their DevOps solution. And some organizations are going faster and safer by virtue of at least their self-reported thing. And there's a long uh, chapter in Accelerate about why surveys are valid. Uh, and this is the last State of DevOps report that Puppet and Dora did together. So put that there. Then one day, DevOps died. Oh. And now it dies every year. In fact, I read, I read SRE's dying now, too. So you got that going for you. And, and then I get to read all these terrible things DevOps did to deserve the death. And that's related to what we're going to talk about now. So English as she has spoke is the reprint of this book that was written to give phrases translating from Portuguese into English. So it was originally published in 1855, and then republished um, several times, actually, renamed as English as she spoke. And the writer, Pedro Carol Carolino, I'm not sure how to pronounce it 100%, um, it's widely believed that Carolino did not speak English, um, and that a French to English dictionary was used to translate an earlier Portuguese to French phrase book. And so this is a quote from Mark Twain, but if you go read about this book, supposedly Abe Lincoln, who was the president of the United States during the Civil War, was amusing himself with this book during the Civil War. So it's like just interesting context. 
So this is a representative sample of familiar phrases. Um, I'll let you read those um, if you like, but there's not time for that, for real. You can go read them, they're, they're funny. I'll just give you one. Apply you at the study during that you are young. It's good advice, right? I can kind of understand what he's going for. Um, honestly, when I read like a lot of blog posts about DevOps or SRE, frankly, it kind of like sounds like this to me. Like I don't think the person that was writing that was fluent in what I would consider the, the practice. They, they had an agenda, right? They, they wanted to do things. So sometimes the problem with books is they're written by people who want you to buy books or to buy something else. But fluency cannot be bought. The path to fluency can be long and hard even when everything in the book is flawless. So I think some of the stuff that we just saw um, Lauren, Logan, or Lauren talk about is, is related to this notion of fluency. Like they didn't necessarily use those words, but if we, if we look at how I'm going to define it in a bit, it's, it's related to that, being, being able to respond. So the, the average human adult can be fluent in a new language in six months. This is what some research suggests. And native level in two years. But in order to do that, you have to meet certain conditions. And so there's like practices and principles that will lead you to do this. There's a YouTube um, channel. Uh, I'll share these later, but there's a TED talk that this guy talks about um, what, what those principles and practices are. But in this, it's argued that the fluency will only be achieved to the level of necessity. Right, so you, you're going to get... You're going to stop learning the language or the, or the skills. I think this also applies to the technical skills when your needs are met, right? So this is how you see some um, populations will live in, in a place where their, their native language is not the language that's spoken, but they'll, they'll never learn the language because they don't need to because they have community, they have whatever, and their needs are met. So just for the sake of, of the definition, fluent, able to speak or write smoothly, easily or readily, ease, graceful, Flowing as a stream, there's lots of streams, and easily change or adapt. And, and for the sake of what we're talking about and, and some of the conversations we just saw, I think this is, this is a good definition for us. Fluency is about being able to change and adapt. It's not a steady state. It's the ability to appropriately respond in the moment. So I'm fascinated with language acquisition, um, skills acquisition in general, but over the pandemic, I, I invested uh, quite a bit of time in trying to get um, some fluency, and I got, I did like every, every lesson on this language um, in Duolingo, and then I, I did an a intensive with native speakers, and it was like, it's not the same. Like the game of Duolingo is not the same as being able to respond appropriately in the moment with native speakers. You just need, you need to push yourself into that to get to the next level. But before you can respond appropriately, you must be in the position to need to. Right? If, you're just, if you're just playing Duolingo, like you're tricking yourself that you're making progress, but you don't, you don't need to do it any better, right? Like you're getting rewarded for this thing you're, you're playing. And before you can respond appropriately, you must be able and willing to respond at all. Right? So, so you, you have to do it bad. You, you, can't, you can't go from not being fluent to fluent if you don't do it wrong. And you must be willing to respond improperly to make that progress. So you, you all that live in Europe are a little lucky compared to us Americans who, like, we, we, we no, no one, everyone speaks English. So we're just like, don't, don't get to experience this the same way. So fluency does not come from accumulating knowledge, but from a physiological response. So this is related to some of the comments that they made. Doing is more important than knowing. You can know the word, but can you use it in the right context? And no one was born fluent. Although anyone can speak whatever their parents spoke to them at some point, right? And progress will stop when our needs are met. So if you, if you are getting what you need, and this, this, is, this is interesting in the research that people argue that children learn languages better than adults. And there's, there's a little bit of a neuroplasticity plasticity thing involved, but it's actually not true. It's that their needs aren't met and they have nothing else to spend their time on. They have no other distractions. So no one decided to SRE. SRE evolved from necessity. 
and learning from mistakes. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give kind of my version in my language, my model of what I kind of think is going on. Um, and it's not specifically SRE, but it's like this systems thinking, kind of like cloud native world we're moving into, right? So cloud native models evolve from this pressure to deliver both high feature velocity and reliability scale. And you know, if you look at the DevOps narrative that I gave you, that really came out of the work that was being done inside of Amazon, Google, Facebook. You know, that was the same community of practice that, that we're talking about today. And this is just an academic framing that I, I got from um, my friend and coworker, and he's a PhD at Carnegie Mellon, or he's finishing up his dissertation. And I think it's a nice framing to have a conversation about some of the work that's going on. So I'm going to start with this notion of three economies. And the, the first thing you have to do is, is understand the two economies. So this is the tension, and it's the core DevOps conflict between the creation of value and this kind of like consistency, or you could, you could frame it as driving down costs or consistency. And this is the tension that plays out in organizational level, individual level. So when you go into the organizational level, you basically see this tension in many organizations between a business unit who's trying to you know, do new things faster, get more customers, they're, they're, they're injecting variation into the system, and then you have operations who bears the brunt of that, and they're trying to control the consumption and get consistency. There's sort of this inherent tension. This isn't even really about IT either. It's an inherent tension between innovation and efficiency, right? And so then what, what Jabe and his research um, introduced to me is language, and I've revisited every DevOps conversation I've ever had through this lens, and, and I fell in love with this language, is the scope economy construct is a, essentially like a clutch or gear mechanism that connects the differentiation and scale economy to enable innovation and efficiency. And here when we're talking about economy, think of it more like game theory mechanics for like what people get rewarded for. Um, and this is another uh, Carnegie Mellon PhD. Um, I'm not necessarily going to read this whole thing, but Demeji, I think he's He's at Microsoft right now. Um, and he talks about platforms. And again, it's not platforms like we think about platforms necessarily, but it's this generalized notion of platforms as an opportunity for two sides to meet in the middle, for, for the binary relationship to meet in the middle. And that scope economy, that platform, emerges from an ongoing negotiation between the selfish interests in favor of the collective interests. So that's a little academic framing, but I'm going to essentially argue every big web company basically built a platform more or less through this kind of Darwinian process, right? So Kubernetes is your friendly neighborhood scope economy trading zone boundary object where, where everyone kind of like can meet and have that. And I, mean, like I'm, I kind of cringe a little bit when people are like, platform is a product. It doesn't have the same dynamics as a product, but it's the ability for these agents to express their selfish interests in favor of the collective interests. And establishing an SLO through the language I just so, uh, introduced is a commoning exercise between SREs and SWEs, or maybe even you consider a three-way contract with the business, that we are going to have this level or this objective level for this service. So th there's this guy. What happens when software engineers SAS what used to be called operations? This is straight from the SRE book. Um, I'm not going to read it. I'm sure you read it. Hopefully you read it. Um, but it's basically arguing that the SREs are building these things so the developers can focus on their business logic and it keeps strong promises to the, the infrastructure. And it's collective interests served in favor of the thing. So this is also straight from the SRE book. And just, just to make sure everyone clear on the language, this is, this is old now, right, in, in internet years. A production platform with a common service structure, conventions, and software infrastructure made it possible for an SRE team to provide support for the platform infrastructure. All right, so this is like platform. And I, I think I said platform more than anyone for the five years at Pivotal. So it's not a new thing, platforms. Let's do it. So SREs build and operate a platform. That platform defines infrastructure or architecture. And this is like, like this mental model I have, this, I call the three layer cake. And this also, uh, at least for Americans, um, maps conveniently to the NIST definitions of cloud, that you have platform on top of infrastructure serving software. Everyone wants to s deliver software as a service. That is software, obviously. But the platform is also software. And the infrastructure, when it's delivered as a service, now software too. And that means you have software development, software operations, platform development, platform operations, infrastructure development, um, infrastructure operations. 
Those can be in-source, outsource. You have like lots of different configurations for what the model could be, but I think it's beneficial to start thinking about these things um, as necessity. Because sometimes when people say developer, it's like developing what? Even, even if you're just working on software, it's not a monolithic thing, right? Especially when you think about front end, back end, whatever, like developer is not a single thing. So this is a little bit reductionist, but I think it gives you a, a nice mental model to think about how to invest in this and particularly the benefit of the, the platform in the middle, keeping that scope economy um, contract. Now, the goal, if these, all these are software, is to keep them coherent and value stream aligned without delaminating, right? So when you see things not working, it's usually because the social system is not, is not aligned. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this. So coming back to Werner Vogel's quote, when Werner Vogels in 2006 says, you build it, you run it, if you know anything about what Amazon actually had internally, Werner Vogels did not mean the two pizza team was going to run all of their infrastructure and build their platform, right? He's talking about just that top. And if you go back to the quote I just took from the SRE book, it's practically the same model. So, like I said, I mean, a lot of organizations are highly regulated and maybe slow moving, and a lot of them now have started to put SRE labels on some work that they do, which looks suspiciously like exactly like the work they used to do. Um, and, and I think one of the one of the downsides of the way SRE gets explained is is it's like, oh, goody, the SREs are going to take away the operational burden from the software engineers. Um, but I think that is not not so good. Nick sehr gut. So to me, the goal of SRE, and it's very similar to some of the things I expressed about what deving the ops should be about, the, the SRE should not be there to take toil away from the software engineers, but to drive that out of the system. That's, to me, like one of the fundamental points of the exercise. But if this was easy, everyone would be good at it by now. Here's what, here's what everyone wants, right? Everyone wants SRE. Who wants SRE? Who wants it? Yeah! Woo! Here, here's what most people really want. Most organizations really want this. Reliability, availability, scalability, operability, usability, observability. Throw some more illities on there, why not? All for free, without changing anything. That's what most orgs really want. And just to make that point, this is a little trick I learned. You just like make it bigger. That, that's what most orgs really want. And, and also change is hard. So this is the J curve of change is hard. So when you, when you make a change and you don't really have the right commitment or resources to it, you're going to go down. Even if you did it right, performance will almost always go down before it goes back up. And, and so this is why you see a lot of these buzzword, kind of superficial initiatives, like they never get back to even where they started in some cases. And this, this is, I, I, I finally realized this in the middle of my DevOps journey, and you're gonna see this over and over in the SRE thing, but it used to get really frustrating to me that people would say like, oh, we had our DevOps transformation, or we, have our, we do Agile, and then it's like, well, why are you so bad at this? Like, you, you say you do it, but you're like, you don't do any of it, right? And, and what, what you have to realize, or what I came to realize, and this is related to this institutional theory, like there's papers about how this happens and why this happens, is that in the early adopters, in the innovators of the early adopters, maybe the edge of the early majority, the motivation is that they're seeking an advantage. They're actually trying to get an advantage. Then what happens is they get one, right? And you start to see the metrics and it's like, oh, cool, it works. We got an advantage. And that, that legitimizes the practice. And what you see later, as it moves into the majority, is that organizations are no longer seeking an advantage. What they're seeking is legitimacy. 
And this is why they use the words and nothing else. Because the words cross the chasm a lot easier and before any of the understanding and practice does. I see people who are like, we're the SRE team. It's like, oh, cool, cool. Like, what are your SLOs? Like, let's look at your stuff. And they're like, we, what are SLOs? Has anyone ever had that? Does anyone work there? No, just kidding. This is me on Twitter. If you build a DevOps silo separate from an SRE silo, you might be an enterprise. <laughs> and then I give you extra points if they don't work together. Because you gotta align the selfish interests in favor of the collective interests, right? If you build it, they might run. <laughs> has, does anyone have an internal platform they build that no developers want to use? You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> so, I, I talked a little bit about this, but these institutional theory, there's, there's, there's other forces. So. Basically, this is kind of the theory of how over time organizations tend to start to look the same. And there's mimetic forces, coercive forces, and normative forces. And we don't need to get into the full academic framing today, but the mimetic force is particularly prevalent when there's a lot of uncertainty. And I think for, for many organizations, this kind of paradigm shift to the cloud is, is creating a lot of uncertainty. And so what they're, what they're doing is based on what's legitimized, what they see as the market leaders, is they're trying to copy the practices that they see as legitimate, that they see as the market leaders, right? And so, you know, they hear Google did this or Werner Vogel said that or whatever, then they try to copy it. So to me, what you want to be able to do, what SRE fluency is, is, is not about taking like whatever you are doing and like doing a new thing with it. It's about reimagining the context. And that's not just about the technology, right? I think this is one of the, one of the things that uh, organizationally, and there's actually a couple of points about this later. Organizationally, people don't realize the preconditions and the org structure and the dynamics that happened at Google that allowed SRE to be what it is. It's not just like this role it's over here, it's part of that system, right? So if we're really systems thinkers, we have to think about the inputs and outputs across that. But you never get a start there. You, like Google didn't even get a start there, right? So this is, this is learning by doing. So an organization that doesn't have an SRE necessity may do unnatural things and call them SRE. Right, so this is related to the, the, the argument I was making about you'll get fluent to the level that you need to. Right, so if an organization doesn't have a need, there's not an SRE-shaped hole to fill with SRE, but you gotta, we, gotta, we wanna have the buzzwords, right? And I, I need funding for this new initiative that I'm trying to get, this new boondoggle I'm trying to get spun up. So you're gonna see this over and over again. More, more and more um, unnatural things called SRE. So just prepare yourself for that. I, I had a conversation with some people, well, because I got here a few days early, and, and people who were SREs at Google and like are gonna give some of these other talks, uh, some of the other keynote talks, they're like, I don't even know what SRE is anymore. I don't even know what it is. It's like, well, that means it's working. <laughs> that means that people are listening. An organization that does have an SRE necessity, may do superficial things and call them SRE. Because it's hard. It's hard work to do it right, to learn to be fluent, to learn to respond appropriately in the moment. It's hard. I mean, that was the, we just watched 45 minutes of people talking about, like, it's complicated, it's hard. Um, another thing everyone should read is the ironies of automation. 
because the comment that was made about how we're going to have these catastrophic things not be able to respond to them, definitely read that. So an organization may do unnatural and superficial things and call them SRE and declare them successful with no other basis other than the declaration. Who's, who's, who works there? I'm just kidding. <laughs> At least until the politics change. So SREs, whoops, yeah. SRE practices and SRE practitioners are limited by the organizational preconditions, inputs, outputs, and feedback loops. And we, if we're going to think about systems, the system has to be the social technical system as well. It's not just SRE as an island. It's that interaction with the rest of that org. And new words let organizations fund new initiatives, right? So there's this DevOps initiative, there's the Agile initiative, there's the SRE initiative, there's gonna be a platform engineering one, ML ops, like DevSecOps, like whatever. Like just pile up the port menus and then the uh, you know, noun illity engineering and then there'll be like new teams added to the work. So this is something I find myself saying more and more. Um, I think it's obvious, but you'd be surprised how, how little thought gets put into this in, in a lot of places. Uh, show me your org chart and the funding model, and I'll predict everything that will be hard for you to accomplish. And the result of adding a new function to an existing social technical system can be very unpredictable, especially if you haven't been thoughtful about those inputs and outputs, and there wasn't a natural place because one of the things I've noticed, and again, I don't know where you work, that organizations are particularly bad at stopping doing things. Right, so you just keep adding like a new thing and a new thing and a new thing, but you don't really stop the other thing to like make the space and do the right thing. It's just adding, adding, adding. You didn't, you didn't solve the abstraction of the social technical part of it, the social side of it especially. You just like added a new, new level of complexity and now this, this team's gonna do this thing in this new silo. And this is related to the J-curve, that organizational performance almost always goes down before it comes back up. So you better be prepared when you're introducing these new initiatives that the organization can push through that J-curve to get to the other side, or you're just gonna end up with a lot of, many lives were lost on those rocks. And this is what I, I, I make this argument with my friends that are kind of in this space. If we're really systems thinkers, we need to be thinking about the organizations as well as the, as the technology. Right? The social side of it informs the technology, and the, the technology is informed by the social side of it. So we need to be designing our orgs and putting as much thought into that social technical context as we are into you know, which service connects to which data and how this cache and all this scale. Like we should be thinking about the scaling properties of our orgs as well as our, and the reliability properties of our orgs as well as our technology. If it feels unnatural, superficial, banal, and insipid, it's probably not going to work very well. That's my advice. Your mileage may vary. Go for it. So are you SRE? Are you DevOps? Are you some new buzzword? I don't even care. Who cares? You shouldn't care either, in my opinion. Like, are you getting an advantage? Are you meeting the needs of yourself, your organization? So what, what could SRE be? What does SRE need to be? Because it, it, will, it will take the shape of the necessity, of the need that it needs to fill. And we, we can push it where we want it to go. So my advice to you is that you need to seek an advantage. You don't, you don't want to be the people who seek, a, seek legitimacy. You're already legit. Too legit. Seek an advantage. That's where you're going to get one. And it doesn't matter what it's called. So I look forward to hearing your stories. And then one last thing. Um, and, and I said a lot of the same things over and over for a long time now. Um, and, and I don't necessarily get tired of saying them, but some, sometimes other people help you say them too. So it doesn't matter how many times we... It doesn't... How many times we say something doesn't matter as much as how many people still need to hear it. Thank you.